Oh, wow. Uh, what a difficult question. Um, I don't know whether there, there was a... I don't know whether there was a single thing we could point to. I mean, it was a... It seemed like there were all kinds of different things, all kinds of economic and social trends that were converging. Um, you know, people gradually getting more and more indebted, um, uh, banks behaving um, more and more um, in more and more sort of risky ways, um, our economy getting more and more dependent on on um, uh, our, our, our our trade deficit getting larger and larger. I mean, there's all kinds of things that sort of all come together in um, in an unfortunate moment in. Uh, 2006, 2007, um, to bring it together. But it's like anything, anything you're dealing with an, a, an, an economic catastrophe of that, catastrophe of that, of that consequence, you can't point to a single moment. I think you have to take a step back and look at everything. Well, I guess, I, you know, what's interesting about Ford is how long the company has persisted um, you know, we're used to capitalism being this incredibly turbulent system. Companies come and go all the time. Um, Ford's been a dominant automaker for essentially the last century, um, which is an extraordinary accomplishment. And the other interesting thing is, it's a reminder about how resilient organizations can be. Um, you know, I'm sure people at Ford would be the first to admit, the first to list all of the mistakes this company has made over the last um, 50 years. It's a long list, right? But that's actually a kind of a badge of honor because it says that this is a company that can make mistakes, learn from them, be resilient, bounce back. Um, and that's the test of greatness because no one's ever going to be perfect. Um, the issue is can you go through an unbelievably difficult stretch as the last couple of years have been and come out smiling? And the answer is this company did. Um, and that's that's what I would, if I was someone else, that's what I'd want to learn from, um, is that, is how well this organization has dealt with adversity over the years. No, I'm actually, I'm pretty optimistic about this. I, I first of all, I don't think, I'm not convinced that, um, that lean manufacturing or lean, lean corporations are less innovative. I actually think that innovation very often is as likely or more likely to come from um, constraints than it is to come from excess, from generous resources. And I also am profoundly optimistic about the ability of, of organizations, companies of all kinds, to leverage some of these new um, social technologies for innovation. I mean, if you can identify uh, a way to productively interact with your customers or your fans or your whatever um, and mine their insights, um, uh, people are going to do it. And, you know, there's no, I don't, I don't think there's anything that's going to stand in the way of the kind of exploitation of, it's a gold mine potentially. Right? I, don't, I don't think, I think that there is, um, and particularly as the kind of um, competitive pressures facing global businesses grow, Companies are going to have no choice but to do that. Um, so it's going to happen. Um, I, I have no kind of um, the days when you could be could stick your head in the sand and say everything we know we're going to develop in our backyard um, are over, and everyone knows that. Well, I mean, you know, I think there are cycles um, in all of these things. We go through cycles where there is a kind of race to the bottom, where Manufacturers have a lot of power over retailers, where it's harder for smaller kind of niche players to make a living. But then we go through cycles where everything is reversed. And I think there is a kind of, I think, I think we ought to think of these trends as they're not permanent trends. They are, they're simply moments when one side has the upper hand and then what happens is the other side learns and adapts. Um, smaller quality niche players will absolutely come back when they figure out a better value proposition, right? And that's what they're doing right now. As they are suffering right now, they're also thinking. And they're saying, you know, maybe we have been failing because we haven't legitimately made a difference between what we're offering and what everyone else is offering. And when they figure out what that difference is, 
they'll return. Um, you saw this, you know, I'm a writer of books. You saw this with bookstores. Independent bookstores got clobbered by the chains and everyone said they're gonna die. Um, they couldn't compete, they, you know, all the same thing people always say. And then what happened? Well, now the chains are dying out and a lot of the independents are coming back, right? Borders is the one that's in bankruptcy. Barnes & Noble is struggling. And yet there are all of these small bookstores that I see flourishing in all kinds of, of urban areas. Why? Because they figured out what a better way to appeal to their to customers, to book lovers. Um, so that's, I, I, you know, I, the, my, my answer is, um, wait. You know, these, the, the trend will always reverse as people um, uh, learn from um, the particular adverse situation they're in. Well, the, the interesting thing about social media, of course, is, is if you look over the digital space in the last five years, it's littered with the carcasses of people, of companies that we were excited about and that didn't make it. Um, Rupert Murdoch paid billions of dollars for MySpace a couple of years ago because everyone was convinced that was the next big thing, and it wasn't. Um, you know, before Google, there was AltaVista and Lycos and all these other search engines that didn't make it. Um, AOL was so big it bought Time Warner, and now AOL probably won't be around in six months. Um, so there, the rules in the digital space are very different from the rules in the older parts of the economy. Uh, it's just so turbulent. Um, everything's up in the air. And consumers are still working out what they want from um, the digital world. We don't really know what we want from Facebook yet. I think Facebook is a, they'd be the first to tell you, they are a rapidly evolving platform. Um, whether they'll exist or, or if they exist, in what form they'll exist, um, they have no idea. Um, and the other thing is that people don't have, um, uh, they don't have affection and loyalty to digital brands the way they do for old line brands. You know, if I had a Focus RS right now, I would love it, right? I'd drive it every day. I would gaze at it longingly in the garage. Um, I don't feel the same way about my Gmail account. Um, it, you know, it's a, just a, it's a commodity service. If someone comes along with a better email service, I'll switch tomorrow. I'll just send a mass email to my friends saying I have a new, new email account. Right? It's not that hard. Um, so in a world where that doesn't generate that kind, same kind of emotional connection to a brand, you're going to have um, a whole lot of turmoil.